جفافها وإن كل غفلة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار. يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد قول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. أتل ما أوحي إليك من الكتاب وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولا ذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون. ولا تجادلوا أهل الكتاب إلا بالذي هي أحسن إلا الذين ظلموا منهم وقولوا آمنا بالله وما أنزل إلينا وما أنزل إليكم وإلهنا وإلهكم واحد ونحن له مسلمون رب الشحر صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العبدة من لساني يحب قولي اللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله اللهم اجعلنا من الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر امين يا رب العالمين. In the name of my Kukwa, today is it revolves around the idea of presenting the message of Islam in the United States and how all of us have a share and a part responsibility in delivering and sharing that message. But I want to begin with three at least major obstacles that lie between us and sharing this message this universal message of submission to Allah, and this universal message that Muhammad وسلم, is the last of the messengers, not that we reject any of them, we accept all of them, but we accept him as the final one. And that the Quran is the final revelation, the final installment, the final testament sent to humanity that applies to all human beings. This is something we have to share with all humanity. And if we live in the United States, we have to share it with people that live in the United States. But there are some obstacles in our path. One of those obstacles that you guys talk about all the time even, and I do too, is how we are portrayed in the media. How Islam is talked about as something evil. How it's a threat. How your Muslim neighbor might be crazy. How they, they have actual footage of people picketing against Muslim children going to public school in some parts of this country. Because I don't want my child sitting next to one of the Muslims. Right? Because they're scared. Why are these people so scared of Islam? Because they've been, Islam has been portrayed as something evil, something scary, something alien. Might as well be from another planet. It's that far off how it's presented. And of course, what is used to make Islam alien? Let's look at some of the arguments that are used in popular discourse to make Islam seem like such a strange thing. One of the first things that's been presented, especially in the Bible Belt of this country, is that Islam is very much against the principles of Christianity. Right? This is an evil religion, it practice, these people practice evil things, and our you know, system of morals and values, they have nothing of them. Which in and of itself is a very hollow claim. You see, if you've ever made da'wah to a Christian, you will know that you can, if you make da'wah to them on the front of morality, that we are against shamelessness, we are against you know, abuse, we're against this and that. They'll agree with you 100%. Our major problem with their theology is, not, is actually not with their morality, it's with their theology, with their belief system. So if you talk to him about Jesus, he'll run out of arguments. And then he'll have to go to something else. So this in and of itself is a myth. And much of the things, what are the, some of the things that are considered you know, so controversial, like the women having to cover? They'll have entire documentaries made on the veil of the woman, right? Does the Old Testament not talk about living veil? You know the Talmud, the Jewish text even says that you, if a woman so much as shows her pinky, the short finger, then this is tantamount to her exposing her entire body. That's how shameless it is. That's the Talmud, that's not even Islamic text, but nobody turns to the Jewish tradition and says, how barbaric, how backward. <laughs> Nothing. There are even, as far as today on the news I was listening, and there was a commentator, you know, a supposedly neutral commentator even saying, how are we supposed to deal with these people in business when we have the perception that they oppress their women? And they, they're, you know, these, they, these husbands, they oppress their wives. And that's just part of their religion. SubhanAllah. You know, and, and we're living in times where, by the way, the abuse of women is a reality in the world. It's a reality in the world, not only in the Muslim world, but in the non-Muslim world also. But you have societies even in the world today, like the elite of Japanese culture, for example, where the, the wife doesn't eat food unless the husband has finished eating and she has to stand behind him while he's eating food. She has to stand behind him. When, he, when he's done, she eats the leftovers. That's part of Japanese elite culture even today. Nobody comments on that. 
And by the way, this was asked by, to Imam Malik rahimahullah. Somebody came to Imam Malik rahimahullah and said, what if I, you know, is it okay for my wife to wait for me after I finish eating, then she eats? And he said, ذَلِكَ بِنْ ذَلِكَ فِعْلُ الْجَبَابِرَةِ This is the act of tiredness. We don't do this. Right? We protect the rights of our women. SubhanAllah. So this is the first essential problem. Popular discourse. And how it's been framed. How we've been made to look like something alien and something apart. And this is actually a part of selective amnesia. You know, we don't look at most Islamic uh, world history, the two civilizations are very much connected. And this idea of, you know, this clash between two civilizations, and they have nothing in common whatsoever, this is absolute nonsense. Some of the greatest universities of the Christian and Jewish tradition were actually established in the Muslim world under Muslim rule. We don't know this because we don't know that part of history. We only know the part of history that the radio commentator or the newscaster wants to tell us. The part that will inflict or incite conflict, that's the part that they want to highlight. So this is the first part problem, popular discourse. How do we engage in that discourse? Here's the second problem. The second problem is our ignorance. The ignorance of the Muslims. You know, I was listening to a, a Baptist minister on the radio who's talking to other you know, Baptists, he's teaching them how to preach to Muslims. He's teaching them how to preach to Muslims. If you have a Muslim co-worker, if you have a Muslim business partner, if you have a Muslim student, etc., etc., how do you bring them to Christianity? He's training the people on the radio on how to talk to Muslims. And they have supposedly a Quran expert, a Christian Quran expert on the radio, going off to explaining how they have to deal with Muslims, what they consider shirk and haram, and you know all these terminologies. And he's talking about the Qur'an and it sounds like he knows what he's talking about and the reality is he's misquoting, misusing what the Qur'an says, completely off from the translation of the Qur'an. But you know what the sad thing is? The vast majority of even Muslims, if they are listening to this guy, they won't know the difference. They'll actually think that's in the Qur'an. What's the biggest weapon some of these people have? In, in, you know, in, in causing confusion and spreading lies about Islam itself, it is the ignorance of the Muslims themselves. We don't even know what Islam says. How are we going to tell somebody else? It's a, it, you know, it's a fair question to ask. If something's being misrepresented about Islam, these ministers, they know more places from the Qur'an to quote to you than you probably even read. And that's a serious problem. We don't know even what we stand for, what our civilization is, what our sacred text says. So this is the second problem. The first problem is popular discourse. The second problem is our own ignorance. But the third problem is the real problem. These two are minor issues. These can be solved. Education can be removed through, or ignorance can be removed through education. It's not impossible, right? Popular discourse can be changed once we start engaging ourselves. It can be changed. But the real problem, the real problem is the behavior of the Muslims. The behavior of the Muslims. That is the, the biggest obstacle to giving the message of Islam to anybody else. It's the biggest obstacle. Let me tell you why. You know how you've ever, you ever heard the expression, actions speak louder than words? Right? So if somebody comes up to the Muslim and says, you people oppress women. You people oppress, your religion teaches you to oppress women. And you say, no, no it doesn't. It actually protects the rights of women. Look at these ayat, look at these ahadith, look at the practice of the Messenger How can you tell me that in a society where every two and a half minutes a rape takes place, you're telling us that we've abused the rights of women? Look at this incredible practice and honoring of women in society and how it completely transformed how the Arabs were. And you know the non-Muslim can point and say, look at the Muslim world, how many cases of spousal abuse? How many cases? How many cases of spousal abuse in this country? How many cases of spousal abuse, husbands abusing their wives, Muslims, in urban? How many cases in Jewish? We ourselves, we ourselves are the ultimate anti dharma Our behavior. You know, the Muslim, we, we protect, our, our, our sacred text calls for honesty, dealing, in, dealing with people with truth. Ulu qawlan salila fi al speak straight forward. Speak, you know, speak in an upright fashion. And yet, one of the worst business decisions you can make nowadays is become a business partner with another Muslim. Because it's, you know, you're going to get, basically, you're going to get, <laughs> you know, you know what's going to happen. And this is popular now. Oh, don't deal with those Muslims. You don't ever know what you're going to get. You know, they're going to swindle you, they're going to undercut you, and they're going to look all religious on the outside, but they will, you know, basically con you out of all your money. That's the popular impression. But how did it get to that point? Our own behavior. So our texts, our Quran and Sunnah are so beautiful, and our behavior is so ugly, it's so ugly, 
But what do people see? People don't see the Quran and Sunnah. What do they see? They see us. They see our behavior. And when they see us, they're not going to care to what their book says. They probably got all this from their book. That's what they assume. So they blame our religion based on our shortcomings. And you know what? As much as we complain about that, as much as we can say, no, don't judge Muslims, judge Islam, in the end, in the end, until Muslims change their behavior, until we represent what our book and the Quran and the Sunnah says, until then we can't really spread this message. We cannot really spread this message. Wallahi, I know brothers that took shahada, they, they accepted Islam by looking up Islam in the public library. But when they came to the masjid, they thanked Allah and said, Thank Allah, I did not meet these people first. Thank Allah, I learned Islam first. Because if I met these people first, I wouldn't even have learned about Islam. I would never even have considered it. How bigotous they are. How they look at you. The way they behave towards you. The way they fight with each other in the house of Allah. These kinds of things, you know, we are turning people away from the da'wah of Islam from our own behavior. From our own behavior. So here's the thing. The vast majority, the vast majority of Muslims, they're not doing da'wah at all. They're not doing da'wah at all. There are some Muslims, may Allah reward them and, and, and bless their efforts and put power in their efforts and barakah in their efforts that are trying to spread the message of Islam within the Muslims and even beyond the Muslims. But their work is being multiplied by zero by all the lack of practice and the corruption of the rest of the Muslims. Because whenever they speak, the actions of the rest of the Muslims speak louder than their words. Those actions are louder than these, the words of these Muslims. We're undoing our own efforts. We're undoing our own efforts. This is a serious problem. And this is the problem we have to resolve. You know, I want to give you, you've heard footballs about the importance of da'wah before. But I want to approach it from a different angle today, inshaAllah, the long-term consequences of not being a nation of da'wah. When we are not a nation of spreading and inviting people to the message of Islam in speech and in practice. If we are not those people, what are the consequences? What are the consequences of that? Of course, the first consequence is that we become the people that might fall under the curse of Allah according to the book of Allah Himself. <laughs> those who hide with the, what we sent down from the book, those who hide it, they hide it, they keep it secret. Those are the people that, and even after the book had come down and we had made it clear to people, those are the people that Allah curses and creation only designed to curse them. You know, Allah has designed special people whose only job is to curse those kinds of people. They were their assigned to that. That's the biggest consequence of not being a nation of da'wah in our speech and in our action. Right? That's the first consequence. But there are other consequences. Allah Azza wa Jal wipes out, by the way, move forward inshallah. There are a lot of people standing in the back and let's make space. Maybe not ta'ala and be courteous to the people around you. The consequences of this are beyond even, you know, that's in the next life, but there are consequences in this life too, in this life also. What we learn from the Book of Allah and the Sunnah of Allah as far as dealing with all the works of all the messengers, and his dealing with previous nations, the ones that have received revelation, we learn basically two lessons. The Muslim Ummah, or the Ummah of